probably need to change up. That's right. Everything about the same. How's that? Not that I couldn't make the place resonate entirely unamplified, of course. Um, there's something very painful about this experience to me, which is that I'm seeing all these people that I haven't seen for many years, and you are unchanged except for a little pigment here and there. And recognizing that that was going to be true, I promised myself that I was not going to name names in my discussion precisely because I'd have to leave people out and I can't bring myself to do that. So I will uh, name really only one prominent name in the, in the course of what I'm going to tell you about. But I want you to know that I'm just going to try to set the context, and it is a considerable and complicated one, for the development of STAR before my talented colleagues who really did the hard work tell you what we did and how we got there. But I'm going to just try and help you to understand really what that world was like, the one in which Xerox decided to participate in these new industries and in which and for which we developed the STAR and uh, the related uh, network services and so on. There's been a wonderful, um, what do you call it, when there's more than one per more than two people in a dialogue, is it a polylog or a multilog or something? <laughs> anyway, there's been a, actually more like a cacophony um, of email discussion about all the firsts and inventions and new ideas and whether they were or weren't new or for the first time, but it's really been invigorating. And so a lot of us had an opportunity to participate in that. I'm not going to try and identify those things, but some of you may pick them out as we go along a little bit later. But first of all, I want to talk about park, not this park that we're in now at all, the same location for part of the time. But this has nothing to do with Xerox Palo Alto Research Center as it operates today, but just a very small window of its long and glorious history from 1970 to 1975, roughly. And of course, I'm only going to talk very briefly about issues directly tied to certain kinds of information processing and computing problems. But having said that, I want to mention some very strong major high points that affected a great deal of what we did. First of all, there was a famous talk given by C. Peter McCullough, who was then a much respected chairman and CEO of Xerox. And in, his, in this famous and much publicized talk, he said that he wanted for the future for Xerox to be the architects of information. This was a great phrase because nobody knew exactly what it meant. And there were quite a few interesting things that you could do and simply cite that as the justification. Uh, but it also made Wall Street feel a good deal better about Xerox's future prospects to realize that they weren't just focusing on um, a sort of reprographic copying and duplicating and so on. There was already the early work um, that had been done by Gary Starkweather and others leading to this thing that we then called SLOT, the scanned laser output terminal, which grew up to be laser printing of the, the kind we, we know today. And this was very cool because we really could print very, very interesting documents with it. But it was really hell to produce those documents at that time. There was a splendid project called POLOS, the Park Online Office System. I came there first to work on, mostly on that project and to help out with uh, the learning research group a little bit. And the really nice thing about this was for the first time we saw how very, very attractive office equipment designed for professional users rather than for clerical users could be. High resolution displays with um, beautiful, carefully rendered fonts pointing with a mouse and having a, a really quality keyboard and so on, and the ability to print the kinds of documents that otherwise we had to get a paper accepted by a publication ever to see our words rendered so beautifully. And now, even if it was entire rubbish, we could see it rendered beautifully in this, <laughs> these wonderful fonts and so on. Um, 
there was a great deal of work at that time, sort of very turgid, interesting work going on in the learning research group, which among other things led to small talk in a somewhat different way of thinking about using screen real estate as well as programming. And in 1973, the Alto and the Ethernet independently were invented, but they began to work together relatively soon thereafter. Um, uh, the Alto back then was a prototype for a um, pad-sized um, computer, and um, Chuck Thacker promised us that it would only take a few years before it went from being a featureless cube, 30 inches on the side, to being this pad-type computer. The functionality of it, though, was very much what was wanted. Um, there was a lot of other creative ferment going on. I won't bore you with the details, but we had people interested in networking and protocols and various programming techniques and very advanced notions in uh, operating system security and memory protection and other things. In the midst of all this, uh, in January of 1975, my friend and principal mentor, Harold Hall, stepped up and agreed to start an activity to try to harvest these ideas into a long-term architecture for Xerox's entry into the new world of the automated office. So he was the one willing to face up to the corporation's uh, sort of mixed and tentative interest in doing this and saying, no, we can do it. Palo Alto is a place where we can get started and put together that story in an understandable way and harness some of these good ideas that have already been developed here uh, in Park. Now, between 1975 and 1980, the, the time period of interest when all of the development was being done, things were very different than they are today. You can't extrapolate backwards from where we are now and get there, okay. Um, there's been a very big discontinuity in many dimensions that's ha occurred since that time. But mini computers were all the rage. If you couldn't do it with a mini computer, it probably wasn't worth doing, was what most of industry thought. And even IBM had begun to package things into mini computer sized chunks for various sorts of reasons, but um, uh, the mu very interesting and cutting edge companies were the mini computer companies at that time. And the idea of the interaction devices that were going to be in front of the users was that they were going to go from being dumb terminals, which at that time still predominantly were teletypes and paper based terminals. It was a great luxury in that world to have an actual screen um, on your terminal. And there were a few intelligent terminals. Intelligence, of course, being a relative term, but it did mean that some of them had a little bit of memory and could be made to do mildly interesting uh, sort of uh, quasi-computational things. But the hot ticket in those days was electromechanical word processing, or a clickety-bang word processing, as we used to call it back then. Uh, IBM was the big lion in this marketplace, and it was one hell of a big business, and they were also challenged by various other people. By the way, if you don't know this, the term word processing was made up by the IBM Deutschland um, engineering group in Germany to be sort of a parallel with data processing. I'd love to know what that German word for word processing was. I'm sure it's um, a real tour de force of sort of... Uh, um, you know, uh, linguistic construction. But in any case, this was then a big business, but it meant, in general, a typewriter imbued with a modest amount of storage and logic. And you could somewhat painfully edit a document, save it onto um, a magnetic tape or a little card. This was a very big business. The big threat at that time to IBM's dominance in this business was Xerox. With a division in Dallas, which because they possessed a daisy wheel printer from Diablo across the bay, a company Xerox had bought, um, had actually introduced quite a nice high performance electromechanical standalone word processor. There was no independent software industry. Software was written by the customers, say Bank of America or someone like that, or by the vendor of a mainframe, but not by anyone else. If you ever wonder where the I in ISV comes from, when the first companies finally started writing software, companies that weren't part of a mainframe company. This was so shocking that a new category was made up and they were called ISVs. 
but there was no such thing during this period of time. The future of office systems was imagined by the pundits of that time to be entire turnkey closed vendor office systems. Burroughs had one, Wang had one, everybody was uh, sort of um, hovering around this idea of the marketplace. And in particular, there was no personal computer industry whatsoever. Near the end of this era, a few personal computers appeared, as you know, kits and then the Apple uh, co completed packages and then a few others, but there was no really strong industry. It was essentially a hobbyist um, business at that time. Inside Xerox, this is very important to understand. That is, this was the climate in which we operated in this period from 1975 to 1980. Xerox had entered and then exited the computer business. That is, they had bought the leading mini computer company of the time, Scientific Data Systems, which was a competitor with digital. And at the time they bought it, it produced primarily real-time, uh, shared, um, very high quality um, mini computer systems. Uh, during the era that it was a part of the Xerox Corporation, it made a turn in the direction of providing business data processing systems. So the Sigma series began to be sold competitively against IBM rather than, for instance, competitively against digital, as had the 930 and 940 and other famous systems been sold. This turned out to be a very tough business to participate in. And in 1975, Xerox somewhat painfully left this business, selling its remaining interests to Honeywell. Uh, but leaving behind, luckily for us, a large number of really talented people in El Segundo, a very strong capability in electronics and certain kinds of system software and a factory, and gave us suddenly sort of a base, a place in which this kind of work uh, could be done. Xerox at that time was by far the largest vendor in the facsimile business. But Xerox was a, by, by the middle of this era, a five or six billion dollar company, and the fax business was a very small few hundred million dollar um, business and not very digital in its, uh, in its nature. The fax business we know today was almost completely restarted from scratch by the revolution in digital logic. Xerox was, had gone from really dominating the copier and duplicator world to suddenly being under a great deal of very stiff competition from very, very tough competitors including Kodak and IBM and Ricoh and Canon and some of Xerox's longtime patent protection had expired. Somewhat worse than that was Xerox had had to agree to an IBM-like consent decree with the Justice Department limiting a number of things that it could do both as to pricing but also as to competitive statements it was able to make in, in the marketplace and so on. So suddenly we had to go to this very um, very sort of uh, Marcus of Queensbury, you know, dignified uh, uncompetitive behavior in the sales force, which was not an easy adjustment for the company to make at that time. We had a word processing operation largely in Dallas, as I had mentioned. Um, it was troubled. They had a hard time bringing it to profitability. Uh, they had a hard time of focusing it down as a business, and there was much energy going into what will we do to fix that operation. Um, the printing systems division, which by the end of this era had begun to build laser printers based on much of the work done here in Park, particularly work that used very clever character generation technology and other things, it was very focused on selling computer printers to MIS departments. That is, big, really beautiful printers that were hooked up to great big mainframes and per produced two pages per second of very high quality output. That was the business that we were in. Not anything to do with casual office laser printing and so on. And at this time Xerox was the perhaps number two or three largest participant in magnetic storage. They owned Shugart which pretty much owned the um, floppy disk business and had a very strong position in the sort of uh, Winchester disk business and they owned Century Data Systems, one of the big players in package disk drives. So there were a lot of things that were true of Xerox at that time and many problems to be worked on or itches to be scratched then they simply don't exist now. These, this list of stuff that I'm showing you here is 
that was the big deal. Those were the things that we were actually focusing on and that were affecting our choices about what businesses we were going to be in. Ever heard of any of them before? I doubt it. Now, when we started this organization, we moved around Xerox a lot. Um, in 1975, we, um, Harold Hall and I, and then Gail Tafani, and then a small growing group of other people, were part of the Information Technology Group's OIS project. By 1976, a quote, division had been started, although it wasn't really the size of a typical division, called the System Development Division. By 1978, it had been shuffled to be put together with some other loosely information-related products in order vainly to try to hold on to one particularly self-centered um, executive who, after they reorganized the corporation to keep him, wound up leaving to run Amdahl anyway. And then in 1980, um, we were kind of snatched from the jaws of death by Don Massaro, who still thought it was a good idea even though other people didn't, and that it deserved to go to, in some way, see the light of day. And so we were lashed together with the Dallas Office Products Division, and were able finally to get our products built and into the marketplace. It was a, uh, it was a case where the product and the ideas were so strong that even though we never could quite have a good home for them, it's also true that no one wanted to stop them in their tracks because they had an obvious merit and an obvious value, even though they were an imperfect match with most of the business objectives of the corporation. What were we supposed to be trying to do? We were trying to do an overall system architecture that would last 10 years with its first implementation being to support electronic copying and printing. And then for professionals who were doing document creation and transmission and storage and so on. And then finally, as a long-term overall successor business, when people would no longer be allowed to cut down trees and there wouldn't be a paper-based office automation industry anymore. In 1975, at Harold Hall's urging, I wrote a document called the OIS Architecture. This um, described these essentially seven points. There was more detail, of course, but I won't put you through all that. The main point, though, is in the parentheses, you see what the ultimate implementation was that we finally did of these particular points that were in this architectural document. That, with some pain, we got um, a uh, people to agree was a good long-term approach for us to take. So the idea was we'd have a packet-oriented local area network. We had already had the three megabit Ethernet as its inspiration. This was to be named the Xerox Wire, and eventually we renamed it the Ethernet because that was a better name. Um, no one used the term client-server back then, but on the ARPANET, there was the concept of user and server. Everything was hosts, of course, but you had a using host with a bunch of terminals and a serving host. And we worked out the way to have that host be a workstation belonging to one person, i.e. a client, as it's now called, and, of course, a structure of a number of servers and server protocols. Um, a scalable CPU architecture in the old sense of the word architecture. Now that there are so many people who do architecture that don't know very much about it, we talk about architecture as if it were design, like the way it is in a building. But in those days, architecture meant not how the box is put together. That's what it did not mean. It meant everything but that, namely the instruction set and the things that happened when you executed them, no matter how you put the box together, no matter what the underlying technology was or how big or small any register was or anything like that. It was the implementation independent design, um, which we did in a document called the Principles of Operation. Um, the, uh, we also, um, operating system research had just begun to go from the Baroque to the Rococo at this time. And we managed to avoid the worst excesses of operating system uh, design. But we did design a very, very modern 
uh, operating system and quite sophisticated for its day. Now, the fact that the VM in there stands for virtual memory shows you what the world was like back then and that memory was still relatively scarce, even though we were thought to be the most reckless and profligate people in the world for having 512K bytes when we went out the door. Woo. And when you hear people talking about 192K machines, those were 16-bit words, and we couldn't quite get into 192K, but I didn't let the pressure off until the last minute, fearing that it would get even bigger. Um, the development environment at that time was also a modern and sophisticated one that we were very proud of and was clearly far ahead of what had been done up until that time. Bear in mind that I'm not naming any of the things that happened after this time. I'm just talking about the stuff that we described in 1975 and shipped by 1981. The servers that were out there were print and file and mail and what today we would sort of call some combination of routers and bridges and gateways, our communication server stuff, including internetworking. And then finally, this idea of the STAR, the 8010 Professional Workstation. Why the STAR itself? Why particularly that last piece? Here's what we were trying to do. I tell you this to put in context what you are going to see demonstrated. At this time, we were really trying to make the first product that professional users would actually like because it added more to their life than just giving them a way to get memos typed and so on. And in particular, we wanted to overcome the idea that this was somehow a unacceptable thing for professionals to do by making a really usable and really powerful workstation. Um, naturally, what we hoped they would then do was to create these elaborate kind of self-serving documents like we did in Park. Um, we had some beautiful typesetting for equations, for example, because if you got people to typeset their equations, then you knew for sure they couldn't print this on anything but one of our laser printers. And that was the whole idea. We wanted to induce people to produce subtle and elaborate documents that would then favor our ability to make money by storing and managing and printing them. And finally, we wanted the brand name Xerox not to just be in the copier rooms and seen by purchasing agents and people who were responsible for duplication. We wanted to get it onto the desks of management in the Fortune 500. So these are the things that we were trying to do at, at this time. This is what the star was about. And um, now Bob Belleville and Bob Garner are going to tell you in more detail about the hardware design aspects uh, of the star. I switched to B, is that okay? <laughs> 